frustrated with people? You get frustrated because you think, what, they're not living up to their potential? Or worse yet, they're not living up to your potential. And when we, when we compare, we look to people, and we look to their faults, it's, it's amazing because what normally happens is this. When we compare others, we usually compare others at their worst to us at our best. I'm never going to compare somebody at their best to me at my worst. That would just not do well for my self-esteem. So what we do is this. We have a tendency of when we're seeing people that, wow, they should do this better because I've done that. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, not only have I probably done better than what they're doing, but I've probably done worse than what they're doing. And we realize, therefore, the grace of God go I. So this is another one of those key things and really what it is to have joy. And we talked about really a good definition of joy as we started this epistle last week. And we really looked at that definition of joy is seeing beauties where others can't. And then here's the thing. Most people can't see beauty when they see themselves as less. We see beauty when we see ourselves as more. Isn't that amazing in our world? Second 
comfort. So keep in mind that when it talks about this consolation, the term is, is you can call it encouragement, you can call it um, comfort. And I like that, that thought of comfort because when you're dealing with thinking less of yourself, I think it's really good to be comforted in that. Normally when we think less of ourselves, it's not a very comfortable idea. I want to think better of myself, and I want you to think better of me, not think lesser of me. And so when we're looking at this, he talks about if there's any comfort in Christ. If you have found any comfort in Christ, whatever comfort you found in Christ, now take a look at, at verse 2, because he says, fulfill my joy being like-minded. Now keep in mind that he has four realities in verse 1. He has the consolation in Christ that compares now to the reality that we can experience in verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. The comfort of Christ is, this, is being paired with being like-minded. He goes on to say, of any fellowship, oh, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love. The second thing he talks about after this comfort of Christ is he says there's a comfort of love. Well, now look at verse 2. After he says, fulfill my joy, being like-minded, having the same love. First he says here, being like-minded, the same as the consolation of Christ. And then he says, having the same love. In other words, where he talked about if there's any comfort of love. Do you understand how that f there's four things that pair in verse 1 to verse 2? The first is the consolation of Christ. Verse 2 pairs with being like-minded. The second is any comfort of love pairs with having the same love. The third is any fellowship of the Spirit pairs with being of one accord. And the fourth is if any affection of mercy pairs with verse 2 of one mind. And so we understand these four realities here in verse 1 now flow into four realities of what we can experience in our life as far as thinking ourselves less. So the first, let's jump back to verse 1, is the comfort of love. The second, he says, is any fellowship of the Spirit. Now when he talks about the fellowship of the Spirit, what we're seeing is this, that in that fellowship of the Spirit, it's that type of koinonia. It's this beautiful fellowship that we can have. Now when when we have that kind of fellowship with, with the Spirit, I, I want to share with you just two passages. Now I want to wait a while before I share with you those passages. We're, 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 there's a better place, I think. And so we're looking at here any fellowship of the Spirit. And so with that fellowship of the Spirit, he now says in, in or I just jumped ahead again, verse 1, he talks about the comfort of love. That's where I was at. And when he talks about the comfort of love, we realize that it's the comfort of his love, not just love in general, but the comfort that we have in God's love. And if you have the reality of his comfort first, his love second, then we see here down in verse 2, you can have that same love. If you've experienced the comfort of the love of God, you can have that love that now flows out of you and flows to other. Now keep in mind, it's one of those things in, in Christendom that they say, if you don't have it, you can't give it. If you've never experienced forgiveness, true, true forgiveness, you can't give forgiveness. If you've never experienced the love of God and have it poured into you, you can't give the love of God. If you've never experienced here the fellowship of the Spirit, if you've never experienced just the Spirit guiding and leading and walking, then you cannot experience being of one accord. You don't know what it is to be united to something greater than yourself. And how do you find yourself in one accord? Well, here's what you do. Usually when you're not in one accord, it usually means this. My opinion is better than yours. In other words, what am I not doing? I'm not esteeming others better than myself. It's like, well, I like your opinion, but mine is better. And we always think that, what does that do? That causes strife. 
that causes no joy. I can't, I can't accept you. I can't accept what you're doing because I think my way is better. And isn't that true even with God? How often God is taking us down a path and we say, God, you're wrong. You should be taking me down another path. That's what you should be doing. I don't know why you're thinking this. And God says, because I'm omniscient and I know the end from the beginning. This is why you're going down the path. We personally see through a glass dimly. We see through a glass darkly. He sees everything right now perfectly clear. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows where we're going to be, and he knows the path he has to take us on to, to bring that. So I think it's important that when you have the fellowship of the Spirit, whatever fellowship of the Spirit you have, you understand what it is to what? What it is to be in one accord. What it is to be in agreement with God. And here's the thing. So often we have this tendency of saying, well, I'm in agreement with God, but you're not in agreement with me. Keep in mind that if we're both seeking God, guess what we're going to do? We're going to find ourselves in what? In a camaraderie. We may do things a little bit different. Why? Because, well, one may be a different part of the body, but we all have the same goal. And that is to see God exalted and to see us in my own life consecrated. I want to be consecrated. I want to be given over to the Lord. And so what he sees is this. The first is the consolation in Christ, being paired with, being like-minded. The second is having the comfort of love, and that is being paired with having the same love. The third in the verse 1 is having the fellowship of the Spirit. That's being paired with being in one accord. And the last one is this. If any affection and mercy. The word being... Tenderness is uh, the better translation for affection. If you have any affection, if you have any tenderness, and if you have any mercy, at that point, the last thing that we see that is being paired with in verse 2 is what? Being of one mind. When you have affection, when you have tenderness and mercy, you're going to look to where other people are being led, and you're going to say, praise the Lord. It may not be exactly where I'm being led, but I'm going to pray for you in that. And rather than saying you're wrong, you should do it my way. You should be open and say, if that's where God's calling, I want to encourage you in that. Because if your whole desire is to glorify God, then go for it. It may not be what God is calling me to do, but I'll tell you what, I will pray for you. I will encourage you and I will build you up. But the problem is, is this, usually in Christendom, if they don't do it my way, they're doing it wrong. And so in the Marine Corps, we usually had, uh, there were, my superiors had a saying that there was the right way, there was the wrong way, there was the Marine Corps way, and then they would say, and there is my way. Guess how we're going to do things. And, and I'll tell you what, it didn't make a difference right or wrong, or even if this is the way the Marine Corps did it, that's the way they wanted it done, that's the way they were going to do it. You had three words, I, I, sir. That's it. Yes, yes, sir. I agree. I will do that. I'm going to comply. And I think so often we have this mentality to think, well, you're not doing it the way we do it. So thus it must be what? It must be wrong. So keep in mind that if a church doesn't teach through the Bible expositionally as we're doing, does that make them wrong? No, it doesn't. If they do topical message and they love the Lord and they, they pray through the messages and the people are taking notes and they're, they're, they're looking to the word of God and they're seeking to let this word consecrate themselves, then they're doing it right. Just because it's different does not necessarily mean that it's wrong. And this is what we see here, that you're now being of one accord. Because what? There's tenderness and mercy. You're not judging, but you're accepting. And it's mercy to say, yeah, it's not what I do, but it doesn't have to be what I do. I'm not going to judge you as if you're wrong. I'm going to pray for you to say, just be led by God. And then you will be fine. And so I love the heart of what Paul is trying to do. So keep in mind that where he's doing this exhortation, and it's one of these things where when you actually look at it in the original language, it's so intense and so beautiful. And I'm not really doing it as justice as I can, but I do want you to know that there are four realities in verse 1 that correlate with this is what God has done and what you can experience and what God has done. 
and then it correlates now in verse 2 to fulfill. You can actually walk these truths out now in verse 2 because what you can walk out becomes as much as a reality as the comfort in Christ and the comfort of his love and the fellowship of his spirit and the tenderness and the mercies of God. And so when you're experiencing all those things, then you can be like-minded. You can have the same love. You can be of one accord and you can be of one mind. And so as he comes through this, it's all about here, this real plea that he's saying, humble yourselves. You can experience all these things from God. And when you experience from God, keep in mind that all these are God's gifts to you. You haven't earned them. You haven't deserved them. It's just grace. And because you've been had this grace poured out upon you, then realize this is grace. Walk in that grace. Walk with no expectation of others other than, I want to see you glorify God. And now he jumps down here to verse 3 where he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of, lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Now he talks about let nothing be done through selfish ambition. It's interesting that the, the term selfish ambitions is more of a term that would be considered rivalries or competition. Remember when we were reading in, in chapter 1. And I want to read to you here in, in chapter 1, verse 16. It said this of Philippians chapter 1, 16. The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add afflictions to my chains. There's a tendency of Christians to be competitive. And this is what we looked at last week, where there was these people who say, I wanna, I'm a better preacher than Paul, and, and more people are going to come to me, and I'll, I'll bring more people to the, to the Lord than Paul ever did, and I'm going to have the power of the Spirit. And there was all this competition. So while Paul was in prison, they're like, look at how they're looking to me now, Paul. No one's looking to you because you're in prison. He's like, that's okay. I don't need people looking to me. I got people chained to me. They don't have to look at me. They're going to hear me anyways. But I think what's interesting is this. We have a tendency so often in, in, in Christendom is to compete against one another. And when I think what happens is this is when we compete, it's almost like subconsciously we're competing for a better blessing. If I do this more than you, God's going to bless me more than you. And I think the, the Lord kind of teaches us and he kind of shows us what it is to be competitive and what it is not to be competitive. There's a portion of scripture found in the gospel of John, chapter 5. And what I want to start doing is I want to start reading here from verse 1. Those of you that realize this here passage, what Jesus does is he, he goes into the pool of Bethesda. Or he goes to the pool of Bethesda. But it declares this, John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Now here's a crazy thing. All these people are what? Are needy. They're needy, needy, needy. But what are they doing? Although they are blind, although they are lame, although they are paralyzed, although they are infirmed in some ways, guess what? They're still competing. It's like, move out of my way. I saw the water stir. First one in there wins the prize. I get to be healed of whatever I have. Competition. I, I want to beat you to the, to the stirring of the water. I want the blessing. And it's interesting here that, that when they have this, there was this one man had an infirmity 38 years. And his infirmity is what? He couldn't walk. It's really hard to get into the pool when you can't jump into the pool, when you can't walk to the pool. And so what happens is this. When Jesus, verse 6 of John chapter 5, saw him lying there 
and knew that he'd already been in that condition a long time, he said to them, do you want to be made well? Do you want to stop competing? Do you want to just come to me for the blessing? And then whatever I tell you, I can bless you. You don't have to compete against all these people. And keep in mind, you've been lousy at competing thus far. Can I bypass this competition? And here he says, listen, do you want to be made well? And then the sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And it's interesting that he says, listen, I can't rely. I can't trust in men. No one is able to say, hey, the water stir and pick this guy up, throw him in. It's just his turn. There is no turn here. It's competition. And I think it's interesting that Jesus, do you want to be made well? He said, I got no one to throw me into the pool. Jesus, I didn't ask you if you want to be thrown into the pool. I asked, do you want to be made well? But his whole mindset was still one of what? Competition, competition. And it's interesting that here, when he said, I got no man to put me into the pool, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. You understand what he did? He bypassed the competition. And I think it's so important that when we are in our own Christian walks, that what we see is this. In that passion passage back in Philippians, where he says, listen, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Let nothing be done through rivalries. Let nothing be done through competition. You don't have to compete. And I love the heart of that because he says, let nothing be done through this rivalry or competition, or he says, or conceit, thinking, oh, you're so lucky it's me who's doing this for you. It isn't about how lucky they are to have the person. Keep in mind that there's an anointing that comes through the worship. It isn't just Regan and Marianne. It's the spirit that wants to flow through them to touch your hearts. If it was just me up here reading, talking, sharing, you guys would just walk out like, this is really bad stuff. But if it's the Holy Spirit that's now speaking, it's the Holy Spirit that's giving his word life, it's the Holy Spirit that's allowing that word to be implanted to your heart, all of a sudden like, oh my goodness, I'm being stirred. You're not being stirred by my words. You're being stirred by his words. You're being stirred by his spirit. You're being stirred by the heart. And there's an anointing that goes on. So I can't say, oh, it's a good thing you guys are here listening to me. It isn't anything to do with that. It's the spirit of God that empowers. It's the spirit of God that blesses. And he says, fulfill my joy. Or he says, let nothing be done, verse 3, through selfish ambition or conceit. Don't think that you are God's gift to whatever ministry you're in. Realize that therefore the grace of God and only by the grace of God are you doing anything. Now, Paul himself was saying, listen, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he says this, and I've done more than they all, than all the apostles. Yet he said, not I, but the grace that was in me. He realized that anything that he accomplished, it wasn't, oh my goodness, how amazing is Paul. It's, oh my goodness, how amazing was the grace of God that God chose to put into Paul. And only that. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't him who penned these words. It was the Holy Spirit in Paul who penned these words. He just happened to be the vessel. And I find it amazing how there are some people in certain churches that elevate the vessels. Think about this. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, and now at the hour of our death, amen. And so we're elevating Mary. They're elevating Mary to a point of, oh my goodness, let's have Mary intercede for us. I'll tell you what, Mary needed a Savior, just as every other person needed a Savior. But think about this. Not only is she not to be elevated, but she's not to be put down either, like she's just nothing. She happened to be this beautiful, godly lady that God chose to use her and her life and to use her as a vessel that through her would come the salvation of the world. And it's an amazing thing. 
But keep in mind, in the same way as, as we, as, as you, know, um, you know, the Protestants in Christianity, look to the Catholics and we say, why are you elevating Mary? You don't elevate the vessel. But how many times do we as Protestants elevate Paul, the apostle? Oh, my goodness. Look at Paul and his words. Look at, you know, look at you know, John and his epistle. Look at Peter and his epistle. Look at Jude, and we look at all these incredible men. Look at Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah. You know, we look to that. And say, they're vessels. And we have a tendency of looking at the Catholic Church, and why are you elevating Mary? But we never look at our own issues and say, why are we elevating Paul? It isn't Paul, it's the Spirit through Paul. And he's trying to let us know, listen, let nothing be done through this rivalry or competition or conceit, thinking that, oh my goodness, look at what I've done more than any other. And so he says this, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So he says, in, in this humbleness of your mind, he said, let each one esteem or judge, judge others superior to himself. Is a better translation. Esteem others better than yourself. Judge others more superior than yourself. This is the key to joy. When you're no longer striving, you're no longer doing anything, but you realize, listen, I'm a lame man and I can't walk and I can try to compete, but I'll never outrun other people. I'll never get to where I need to be to get the blessings on my own and no one's going to help me get to where I need to be. And Jesus, stop the rat race. Stop competing. Just listen to my word. Pick up your bed. Go. I can do that? Yes, you can. I don't have to get in the water first? No, you don't. All you have to do is what? Stop competing. Listen to Christ. Walk with Christ. Do what he calls you to do. And as you do what he calls you to do, all of a sudden you're going to find yourself blessed. But when you compete and when you think it's only me and when you're doing all those things, keep in mind you're going to find yourself with no joy. Why? Because you can compete and you can beat certain people. But keep in mind, there are going to be off days where what? You can't compete against anyone. You just won't be able to. And so if you're, if you're finding joy in competition, always being ahead of the other person, keep in mind that when you come to that point where you're not going to have a good day and you're not ahead of the other people, guess what? Now your joy is going to be gone. But if your joy has always been, God, it's your grace that has got me through this day. It's your grace that has led me, your grace that has empowered me. Whatever you do, this is your glory. Have a good day, have a bad day. It's all okay because what? I still know it's God who's doing a work. And I realize that without him, there's, there's, there's nothing that I can do. And so I love this verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition, this rivalry, this, this competition or conceit, thinking that I'm better or I'm doing it well. But in lowliness of mind, how to have joy, esteem others better than yourselves. Verse 4, let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. And so we're seeing here, he talks about, I want you to look out not only just for your own interest. Don't just think this is what I need and this is what I need. But start looking and say, what do they need? What do the people that God put in my life, what do they need? And how can I seek to minister to them? And not how can they minister to me, but how can I minister to them? And if you have that heart of not looking out for your own interests, but, but how can I bless others? How can I minister to others? Well, he says this. When he says, let each one of you, verse 4, look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others, he says, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He talks about a frame of mind. And within a frame of mind, keep in mind that, you know, the, the, the scriptures really want us to understand that if you have that right mindset, if you put your mind in the right place, your heart's going to follow because God's going to move on your heart. But your mind has to be what? It has to be knit to God, knit to his purposes. And he's going to open those doors. Remember, we looked at this last week, but I want to share it one more time with you. But in verse 13 here of chapter 2, and we'll get there a little bit, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's God who's going to do this work for his own pleasure. And so he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, I want you to have a right mindset. 
Verse 6, he said, Whose being the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is probably one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture. And I don't know this for sure, but it's probably one of my top five that I've quoted in more messages than any other. And it's because there's such a powerful picture within this. Now, when he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. It's interesting. He says, being the form of God. And it's interesting, he was in the form of God, didn't even consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, by saying, I'm God, and I'm everything that God is, that it did not in any way lessen God or rip off God from his glory. He says, me claiming God, he says, I'm in no way saying, God, you're less. And I'm not trying to put God down. He's not trying to do that. He said, I'm equal with God in every way. And he says, now, so what he does is, he says, who being in the form of God, not considering it robbery to be equal with God, he makes himself of no reputation. What does it mean being in the form of God? I want to read to you a, a passage here, actually a couple of them. I want to start by reading Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, I want to read from verses 10 through 19. Now, when John the Revelator was there in heaven, it said this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, Revelation 1 verse 10, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white like wool as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand the seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That is God. You see this picture of Christ, and as he's there, he falls on his feet. He falls on at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am him who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys to Hades and death. Absolutely, this beautiful passage that we see here. And so he says, write these things which you have seen and all the things that are and all the things that will take place after this. And so we see here in Revelation 1, 10 through 19, this glorious picture of Christ as John here, the revelator, looks to the Lord, sees the Lord and is just humbled by this God. And as he's humbled by this God, I want to share with you another passage found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9, I know you're familiar with this passage and this event that took place, but it begins this, Luke chapter 9, I'm going to start reading from verse 27, I'm going to read through verse 36, and in Luke 9 he said this, verse 27, but I tell you truly there are some standing here who should not taste death, they see the kingdom of God, verse 28, now it came to pass, about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. 
And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those who were heavy with sleep, when they were fully awake, they saw his glory, the two men who stood with him. And then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days of the things that they had seen. This is called the transfiguration. And what happens is this is Jesus is there praying. And as usual, when Jesus is there praying, the disciples are sleeping. That's what they did when Jesus prayed to pass the time. And eventually they woke up. They found here's Moses and Elijah, and, and they are now fully awake, awake. And Peter said, oh, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And he goes, here's a great idea. We have, we have Jesus here. We have Moses that's the law. We have Elijah that's a representation of the prophets. We have, we have here the, the Messiah, the law, and the prophets. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's build three things to the law, the prophets, and to Jesus. But of course, you first, Jesus. Let's build three tabernacles. One for you. First is you. That's the first thing we're going to do. Let's build one for you. And then we realize, and then he says, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You, then the law, then the prophets. And then God came and he overshadowed. He says, this is my beloved son. In other words, Peter, button it. <laughs> it's not about the law. It's not about the prophets. It's about my son. This is my beloved son. Hear him. He fulfilled the law, fulfilled the prophets. Don't look to the law. Don't look to the prophets. There are not going to be three tabernacles. There is one. Jesus Christ, he tabernacled among us. And it's interesting here that Jesus, he's, his glory is radiating through his flesh. His glory is radiating through his clothes. And as they're seeing him glorified, they're now just astounded. And all of a sudden they wake up and they go, oh my goodness, I've been missing something here. This is what happens when you sleep in prayer meetings. You miss the glory of God so often. And it's just so powerful here that they missed it. They were about to miss it. And as they wake up, they're able to experience here just the very glory of God coming through. And that was, we saw, you know, John here in Revelation seeing Christ in his glorified form. We see here his earthly form where his glory shining through. One other passage I want to show you of Jesus Christ found in John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, a beautiful passage where it begins to open up. But I want to share with you here. Beginning in verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour has come, that he should depart from this world unto the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And after supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God. All right? He knows who he is. He knows where he's going. Then it said this, Verse 4, John chapter 13, he rose from supper, supper, laid aside his garment, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This is God. This is the same God. And this is the heart of this God. And what we see is this, that Jesus Christ, who being the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. Now, in John chapter 14, um, just this beautiful um, picture where Philip is going before the Lord and he says, show us the Father and it's sufficient. He says, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I think it's interesting that, you know, we, we see over and over again how um, just the, the Lord constantly is trying to, to, to show 
who he is. And, and I think it's in where in, in John chapter 10, verse 30, he said, um, he said, I and my father are one. Uh, we're, we're, we're one in essence. We're one in glory. We're one in everything. And so we see here that Jesus over and over again, just he is God in the flesh. But as he's that God that we saw in, in Revelation chapter 1, as he's that God that we saw there in Luke chapter 9, he's the same God who then takes his garment that at one point was radiated, his glory shining through, puts it aside, takes a towel, girds himself, washes his disciple feet. And this is what verse 6 is all about, who being the form of God did not consider it robber to be equal with God. But, it says this, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. Now when it says he made himself of no reputation, what he's really saying is this, that he's emptying himself. Um, the, the word is probably better translated that, that he's, um, he's made empty, a um, couple of passages I want to read to you. First is found in Romans chapter 4, verse 14. And, and what we see is this. In Romans 4, verse 14, as we look to this passage, we see here that Jesus, or Paul, as he's writing this, makes this incredible statement. He says, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Void and no effect. This is what Jesus said here when he says he made himself of no reputation. He made himself void. He made himself empty. He made himself of no effect. And, and so we see here another passage I want to read to you is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. In 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Paul is talking about his faith. He's talking about his walk. He's talking about his ministry. But he makes this statement in 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For if Christ did not send me to, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That made of no effect, same word that's used here. He made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no, um, he's, he made himself void. He emptied himself. And so we see here this. Keep in mind that I do have to make a note because there are people who are in error in their theology when they say that he emptied himself of his deity. He did not. He was fully God. He was always fully God. He was the God-man. He was fully God, fully man. Now, when you say he emptied himself, keep in mind that what we're seeing is this. As a man, he emptied himself of his glory and he emptied himself of his majesty. In other words, the God who was there in, in you know, Revelation 1 the God who was there in Luke chapter 9, he does what? John 13. He lays aside his garment. He takes a towel. He lays aside not his deity, but his majesty, his glory. If he walked around on earth as we saw him there in Revelation 1, there would have been no one who said, oh, wine, bibber, and glutton, you are. No, no. They would have all flocked to him. They would have been terrified but they would have flocked to him. So we see here, he lays aside that garment. He lays aside that, that, that glory. He lays aside that majesty. He lays aside that, that outer glory of God. Still has it on the inside. But he makes himself of no reputation. He empties that part of him. Taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. Now as he comes, as a, he, keep in mind, he's God. He now lowers himself to become a man. Then he lowers himself to begin to become a bondservant to men. And then it says this, And coming in the likeness of men, verse 8, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Talk about someone who goes lesser and lesser and lesser. So first he's God, he comes as a man, as a man he becomes a bondservant. As a bondservant he lays down his life. Incredible, we see the, the path of humility is lower and lower and lower to the point of death. And to be honest with you, it is true for every man, woman, and child who claims the name of Christ. The path to glory is this. Humble yourself and humble yourself and humble yourself to the point of what? Die to self. You can either push yourself and push your agenda or you can die to self. And if you die to self, you realize, okay, Lord, you know, I'm going to die to self. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to choose to live for you and live for others, whatever you call me to do. 
this is where you find true joy. Because when you're serving, when you're doing, there's a joy that comes with that. Not always the joy of doing, but the joy of knowing that, God, you're being glorified because I'm walking in your heart. I'm walking, you know, I'm imitating Christ. These are the things that we do. And because he humbled himself so low, verse 9, God elevates him what? Higher than anyone. See, he humbled himself. He went from the highest point to the lowest point. So God elevates him back to the highest point. Now, when we try to say, well, I'm going to go from a middle point to a lower point, then God's going to bring us back up. But if we're from a middle point, say, I'm going to elevate myself, what is God going to do? Hey, you humble yourself, you know, you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. You humble yourself, you'll be exalted. And so it's important to realize that now, verse 9, therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. This is the name in which there is salvation. There is one name above all names, and we find that it is the name of Jesus. So verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every knee, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue is going to confess. So does this mean that everyone is going to be saved? No. Keep in mind, they're not going to be saved, but what's going to happen? They're going to be damned, but before they're cast into that second death, they are going to bow the knee, and they are going to confess, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And then, depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. And it's a terrible, fearful thing that's going to happen, but keep in mind, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess and so we see that as every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And so here, this is so amazing that as every knee bows, as every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord, the Father's like, yes, yes, this is true. Yes, this is right. And it's all because he humbled himself when he's saying, listen, back to verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If he could go from the highest point to the lowest point, can't we go from the place that we are, are lower or must we go higher? And I just, I love his heart. I love how he works. And so now in verse 12, he says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So he says, while I was there, you listened, you walked, you were teachable. He says, now I want you to be teachable as if I was there. He said, I know that you'll be teachable even more so now that I'm not there. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He said, you're not working out other people's salvation. You're working out your own. It's about, Lord, what are you trying to do in me? And I'll tell you what, when it comes to working out our own salvation, not only do we need to do so as individuals, but to be honest with you, we need to do that as churches too. We don't need to work out the next door neighbor's church's salvation. We just have to work out ours. It's our consecration. It's our drawing close to God. And, and so I think it's just so important that, that what we do for service, it's about what I'm going to do, not what someone else has done or what someone else is doing, just what God has called me to do. I need to be open to his spirit, open to his word, and let him lead me through this. Now verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Everything that we do, it's God. No more, no less. It's just the Lord. And he's the one who impresses upon us with his spirit to desire to do something, then gives us the ability to do something. And what? It's for his pleasure. So you and I can't even say, I had this great idea. No, God impressed upon me his idea. Then God, through his spirit, enabled me to do his idea. And we take credit for it. Like it was some great idea that we had. <laughs> I'll tell you what. It's not some great idea that we have. It's God in his grace impressing upon his spirit. And I think it's so important to realize that if it's not God in his spirit impressing upon us, none of us seek after righteousness. None of us pursue God other than him what, standing in our path saying, hey, here I am. We're going to do this. Come on. And so I love the heart of it. He says, it's God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And then he says this, do all things without complaining and disputing. He makes a statement where he says, I want you to do this, and I don't want you to complain. And I don't want you to argue about it. 
And I think it's so important. We, we had this, this, we touched on this topic a little bit um, prior to getting to this portion of scripture where we realize that if you're really a servant, and this is what he said, are you going to complain because people aren't noticing how well of a servant you are, how much you do for others? And it's one of those things, if you're really, really a servant, to say, wow, I'm going to serve to the point of death. And I'm going to serve, and I'm going to make myself of no reputation. I'm going to empty myself. I don't need you to pat me on the back or give me a participation trophy or anything like that. I just need you to just let me serve you as God directs me. And so I think it's just so important to do all things without complaining. Don't complain because I've been doing this and doing this and doing this and nobody's ever noticed, nobody has ever thanked me, nobody's done it. Listen, you want your reward here on earth or you want it in heaven? Because the people say, wow, you did so good. Well, there goes your reward. And, and, and don't expect one in heaven. You, you got the pat on the back. You got the participation trophy here on earth. Don't expect two. And I think it's so important as we see this, he said, you need to do it without complaining. He says this, and without disputing. Don't be arguing with God to say, wow, why aren't I being noticed? Why aren't people, you know, paying attention? Why aren't I getting more claps on the back here? Then it's one of those things where you do it without complaining, without disputing. And I think it's so important that if, if you're a true servant, I think, you know, we, we realize, oh, my goodness, Lord, I, I don't want to have people notice me. I, I don't need to have people notice me. I don't need to know, have people notice what I do. I just need to do it to you. And when you who see me in secret, <laughs> you'll do what you do so well. You'll reward openly. And that's what he did with Christ. Christ didn't do it for a reputation. Christ did it out of obedience. So much so that what? When he was there on the cross, all left him except some women, his mother, one disciple. They were all hiding. They were all gone. They were all running. And it's interesting that there was, there was just really even no one with him when he was up in, in the, the Mount of Olives praying. Who was there? Well, they were there, but they were sleeping. So were they really there? And I think we look to this and we realize, oh my goodness, here, you just do things because God calls you to do it, not for being noticed. And even if you're all alone in it, you realize, I'm going to do this because what? It's the Father's will. And if I can do anything to give someone else life, in other words, a closer relationship to the Father, that's what I want to do. And now he says this, after he says, do all things without complaining and disputing, verse 14, verse 15, he says, that you may become blameless. And harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. He said, I want you to become blameless. I want you to become harmless. I want you to become a child. And what's interesting is this. Have you ever noticed how a child, when a child is in their right mind, doesn't try to assume authority over the parent? Now, every parent knows that what? When a child tries to assume authority over them, and you say, go pick up your toys, and the child says, no. What do you do to that child? Well, you recognize and you let them know, no, I'm authority. One way or another, you're going to learn this. You're going to learn it through a discussion. Or if you continue with this heart of not wanting to learn and you show rebellion, then we'll discipline you. But one way or another, you're going to realize the authority until the child says, you say, pick up your toys. Okay, I'm going to pick up my toys. But that's what a child is. Paul, so beautifully here in verse 22, will talk about this. When he talks about Timothy, he says, You know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. You understand what Timothy did? He took a subservient role as a child to his parents, saying, You lead, and I just want to follow you. What a glorious thing. So this is what he says in verse 15. That you may become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He says, shine. Shine as a light. Shine in humility. Shine the light of Christ. And then he says this, verse 16, holding fast the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. He says, what I would hope is this, that you hold on to the words that we've discussed. Hold on to these words that say what? If you want joy, man, elevate others. If you want more joy, humble yourself. 
The more you do those two things, and I know in the world it seems completely backwards. The world says if you want to, to have joy and everything else, and you're going to you know, lower others and, and elevate yourself so you can stand above the crowd and you can say, oh, look at how good I am. That's, that joy is not going to last because eventually, guess what? Someone else is going to knock you down off the peg and say, now I'm the top dog. There will always be someone bigger, always be someone stronger, always be someone faster, always be someone better. Humble yourself and just say, you know what? You win. <laughs> you win. And, and when you do that, have you ever had a competition with someone who just kind of gives up? Well, let's have a race, and they don't run, and you're the only one who runs. It's like, man, you know, why even bother? I, I don't have to race, and I don't feel good about winning because I ran against myself. Yeah, that's the competition. Let them run against themselves and pat themselves on the back. You don't have to do that. And so I love the whole point where it says, verse 16, holding fast the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run or labored in vain. He says that you would hear these words and walk these words. So Paul says this in verse 17. Yes, if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul talks about being poured out as a drink offering. I want to read you just a couple of verses from 2 Samuel 23. I just want to read you verses 15 through 17. There's a passage here in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 15 says this, And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but he poured it out to the Lord. He said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. And these things were done by the three mighty men. They brought David this drink of a cool well that he remembered from his youth as they're there around the garrison. He said, oh, if I can only have a drink from that well, I remember I'll go, I'll get it for you. They brought David at the risk of their own lives and said, I can't drink. This is, this is your blood. You risked your lives. This is too valuable for me. I'm not worth it. So he gives it to God. He gives it to God. I think this is so important where he says in verse 17, if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, it may refresh you. I'm just giving myself to God. That's who deserves this. On the sacrifice and service of your faith, and I'm glad and I rejoice with you all. If I can be poured out and, and, and God can be blessed as, as you guys are being refreshed and quiet, says, I'm okay with that. Now, verse 18, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. You also pour yourselves out. Pour yourselves out as an offering. And now verse 19, but I trust in the Lord to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state for all seek their own not the things which are of christ jesus but you know his proven character that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel therefore i hope to send him at once as soon as i see how it goes with me but i trust in the lord that i myself shall also come shortly so what paul is doing is he's going to be sending timothy to them now I don't know if you remember, there's, um, there's a saying that goes with Hallmark since 1944, and it says this, if you care enough to send the very best. <laughs> and Paul, he cared enough to send the very best to the Church of Philippi. I'm going to send you Timothy. <laughs> I'm like, you're like a Hallmark heart, man. You're, you're the best. You're going to encourage. You're going to build them up. It's going to be just amazing. And so we see here, he says, but I trust in the Lord to send Timothy to you shortly that, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Timothy is going to be spot on when he does it. He says, because I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. He says, I don't know anyone other than Timothy who, who will love you like I've loved you, who wants to bless you like I want to bless you. He has the same heart. And he says, for all seek their own and not the things which are in Christ. There's all this competition. There's all this, this, this rivalry that's going on. Timothy doesn't care. He just wants to see you blessed. 
He said, but you know his proven character, verse 22, that as a son with his father, he served with me. He, he literally took the lesser role, and, and I know his heart. Therefore, I want to send him to you at once as, a, as to see, you know, as soon as I see how it goes with me. As soon as I realize that hey, it's, I'm getting out, that I want him to go, and that I trust that in the Lord I myself shall also come to you shortly. So when, when, when I don't need his ministry here, I'm going to send him to you because you guys need him there. And then verse 25, he says, And yet I, could, I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. So he talks about here a man who they sent to minister to Paul. And he says, Although Timothy isn't there yet, I'm sending a forerunner to Timothy. I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need since he was longing for you all and he was distressed because you've heard that he was sick. At this point, we realize that Epaphroditus was, when, when they heard that he was sick almost to the point of death, they were like, oh my goodness, he says, I just wanted to let them know I'm doing well. I want them to see me. So verse 27, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him and not only him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I was so grateful that God healed my friend and fellow worker and my brother, and fellow soldier, and your messenger, the one who ministered. And I was so grateful that he healed. Otherwise, I would have had sorrow upon the sorrow. Therefore, verse 28, I sent him to you. I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in high esteem, because... For the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. What's interesting is here, Epaphroditus would literally come as what? A servant to Paul. And he would serve almost to the point of death. What does that remind you of? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in a position, came as a servant and served to the point of death. And we see over and over this beautiful passage how Epaphroditus, where Paul says, and I want him to come back, and I want him to encourage you. And isn't that just like God? Jesus Christ, who being the form of God, came to serve as a bond servant, went to the point of death, and God says, don't worry, I'm going to send him back. <laughs> I'm sending him back to you guys so you can be encouraged. And so you see here this beautiful picture as Paul says, you know, I see Christ, but I see Christ in Epaphroditus. And as Epaphroditus served, you see this beautiful parallel. And let us be those who say, Lord, we want to become servants. And not, not ones that are bragged about, not ones that are looked at, not ones that are pat on the back or get the participation patient trophy. I, I don't need that. I, I'm just, I'm doing it for you. And, and you put onto my mind what you need to me to do. And you Give me the ability to walk those things and let it be your grace and your grace alone. So that what? So that it's your glory and your glory alone. Let that be our heart. Let that be our prayer. Amen? Amen. Father, we are so truly, truly grateful for your goodness and for your grace and how you work and how you move. And Lord, we're asking that, that by your grace and by your goodness that you will, Father, um, give us the mind. Give us that mindset, Lord, that we would be those who, as we learned last week, elevate others, and we would be those who, as we learned this week, to lower ourselves, that we would abase ourselves, that we would humble ourselves, Lord, um, that, that if we're ever exalted, that we, you would be the one who exalts us in your time and according to your purpose and for your glory, Lord. That as we are exalted, if we are exalted, Lord, it's, it's, it's you that we just want to lay our crowns and our jewels at your feet, thanking you, Lord, for what you've done. And so, Father, have your way here. Have your way in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful, beautiful portrait and this example of how we can have more joy. Lord, the world can't see it. And those who are carnal cannot understand it. But we who are of the Spirit, we know of the truth. We've experienced it in some ways, some minor, some major, but this is the truth, Lord. Help us to walk these truths, we ask in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, amen. amen.